was an orphan. And look what he was able to do. Look what he was able to build. It was during the Revolution that Jackson first confronted and defied an arrogant elite. Does that sound familiar to you? I wonder why they keep talking about Trump and Jackson, Jackson and Trump. Oh, I know the feeling, Andrew. <laughs> Captured by the Redcoats and ordered to shine the boots of a British officer, Jackson simply refused. The officer took his saber and slashed at Jackson, leaving gashes in his head and hand that remained permanent scars for the rest of his life. These were the first and far from the last blows that Andrew Jackson took for his country that he loved so much. From that day on, Andrew Jackson rejected authority that looked down on the common people. First as a boy, when he bravely served the revolutionary cause. Next, as the heroic victor at New Orleans, where his ragtag — and it was a ragtag militia, but they were tough — and they drove the British Imperial forces from America in a triumphant end to the War of 1812. He was a real general, that one. And finally, as President, when he reclaimed the people's government from an emerging aristocracy. Jackson's victory shook the establishment like an earthquake. Henry Clay, Secretary of State for the defeated President John Quincy Adams, called Jackson's victory mortifying and sickening. Oh, boy, does this sound familiar. We're <laughs> Have we heard this? This is terrible. He said there had been no greater calamity in the nation's history. The political class in Washington had good reason to fear Jackson's great triumph. The rich and powerful, Jackson said, too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Jackson warned they had turned government into an engine for the support of the few at the expense of the many. Andrew Jackson was the people's president. And his election came at a time when the vote 